Welcome to The Inside. This was the week the world held its breath in disbelief as one of its biggest movie stars assaulted a presenter on the Academy Awards telecast. And as the Will Smith drama played out nonstop in every conversation on just about every media platform, we were reminded again of the power of movies and their stars to drive our cultural conversations. I am Jim Chabin in Los Angeles, and with me is Wim Byans. He serves as CEO of Cineonic, and he joins us live from Brussels, Belgium, where it's evening. Good evening, Wim. Hey, good morning, Jim. Our last guest was Pete Hammond of Variety. We talked to him the, the week before the Oscars about how great the Oscars could be. We had high hopes for Dune, which won the big awards at our, our show. And then the slap heard around the world. Uh, did you see it? And was it as big a conversation topic where you are as it was here? It was, it was. And I think it was over all social media, I have to say, right? And so everybody has uh, right away had an opinion ready, right? And then, but it, no, it was, it was definitely the talk of the town here. Um, and, and it was on all social media. So it, It's a reminder, I think, of how famous uh, a movie star really is. And so everyone seemed to want to talk about it. So it's, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, there's an interview this week in uh, The Wrap with Bob Iger. He told Chris Wallace of CNN this week that he doesn't think people are going to go back to the movies quite in the way they did before and that work needs to be done to get people back into cinemas. He said, when you consider what you have to do to go to a theater, which is drive there or commute there in some form and pay a transportation, parking, get through the lobby, sit in a large room with a lot of people, there is friction there. It's, it's, it, and for some people, it's not going to be worth it. So his point was we need to do a better job of making that experience seamless. That's kind of one of your major thoughts and topics. Uh, and I want to talk to our, our guest today about that. But upshot of it is people want to get people back in cinemas and, and uh, we're looking at ways to make it easier for, for fans to get back, right? Absolutely. No, I don't think I can say it better. Right? I think we have the perfect guest here with us here on the show today. John C. Hall has a 30-year career in the entertainment business. After starting as a manager at AMC Theatres, John joined Universal Pictures in Hollywood. He worked in exhibitor relations, in theater marketing, and finally as EVP of distribution and marketing. Since 2020, he has served as a partner and producer with Carmel Trio Pictures in Los Angeles. Welcome, John Hall. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be on the podcast. Great to have you here, and thanks for your time. Let me, let me kick it off with the first question here. Give me your perspective about the, the content boom we see today, and how you're experiencing that today. It's definitely a renaissance of content, and, and it, it makes me excited because there's definitely room for all this content in the marketplace. But I've always been a fan of the theatrical experience, as you just sort of laid out in my in my bio. I actually started in television, but I've been a, a movie fan my entire life. And most of my career, you know, 99% of my career has been in the movie business. So I welcome the content boom. I think there's different types of content that live on different types of platforms. And theatrical has its place, as as it always has. Uh, for over a hundred years, and I'm excited. I, I welcome the content. I welcome the competition, and I think that movies will endure well into the future. So, John, you have always seen getting fans to movies or getting exciting of movies to particular films, right? In your opinion, what does it take to prepare for a release, and what is the goal of the marketeer uh, when he's selling the tickets? Any strategy you have of gathering the audiences? The first thing I, I always thought about at the studio and my team did and worked closely with the marketing and distribution teams on, on this particular thing, it's, it's AV or you know, audiovisual or the trailer. Sometimes it, the first debut of any movie is um, content that ends up on, on television. If there's like a big marketable thing that happens like the Super Bowl, oftentimes that'll be kind of the debut of the AV content, but there's really nothing that replaces that visual and audio combined that is that is movie making. And so when you put together a world-class trailer and you debut that on a dark screen in front of a big, big tentpole movie six months to a year ahead of its release, 
there's just something that you cannot measure. Uh, I mean, we, we do research, the studio side does tons of research, and they've actually found that AV is what sells the movie. Majority of the decisions to go to that movie are, are based on watching that piece of content. And then all the content that comes out in marketing after that is usually a reduction of that two, and, two, two and a half minute trailer. If you go too much less than that, unless you're doing a teaser, um, you don't show enough to, to interest the audience. And if you show more than that, you, you get that backlash of they showed the entire movie in the trailer and, you know, nobody, nobody wants that. Are you saying that it is the trailer played in a movie in a cinema? That yes. That is the most, as yeah. opposed to just most buying effective. TV. Yeah. Like when you can, you can buy television and, and through some of the large conglomerate partnerships, you know, um, most of the major studios have a network or access to a network and they can run a full two minute trailer on that medium. Uh, it just doesn't have the same impact. And, you know, it, it's better, I think, to debut something theatrically, especially when you're dealing with like a like genre you know, just easy to, easy to go to Disney because Marvel has been, you know, Marvel has been a big part of resurrecting, you know, the box office in the last decade or more. And they, they, why would they not, you know, why would they not trailer their next big movie on that movie? It's just the perfect audience. It's a captive audience. You know, it's 100% a movie going audience. When you show something on television, whether it's through a partnership or whether it's paid media, there's no guarantees that that's a 100% target audience. In fact, it's definitely not. Uh, it might be less than 50% of a target audience. So AV is important. The second part of that question, and, and this, this is something you work equal parts with the marketing folks and even the distribution side, is, is conversion. Like I always dealt with conversion. Whatever it is that you can do to convert a general public person or a general moviegoer into a specific moviegoer purchasing that ticket for the intended title, that's conversion. Mostly that takes place on digital because at, at that point in the process, you assume these moviegoers have seen, you know, multiple pieces of AV. In fact, on most big $100 million marketing spends, the average I think is like that person's been exposed to that content three times uh, or more. So when I'm making my purchase decision, and you can do that, you know, on any of the ticketing sites, you know, Fandango, Movie Tickets, any of the exhibitor sites, AMC, Regal, Cinemark, when you make that ticketing purchase decision, that's the conversion. And so the follow up to what my team did, my business unit did in concert with others was make sure that they're buying a ticket to our movie. So here's a question for both of you. When your team build the projection and the sound and all the experiences once you're in that cinema hall, and John, you're you're creating the content that goes on the screen. What about the lobby? The lobby of most cinemas, you know, that concept has probably not changed a lot in the last hundred years. And I think Iger, Bob Iger was saying in this interview that he did was there are a, a series of things that you have to do to get into a cinema in order to get into that seat that you're talking about that's comfortable. John, you did in theater marketing, one of your hats at Universal. What what do you think needs to happen in a in a cinema lobby? When I was running in theater marketing uh, a few years ago, I looked at the, in, you know, like business at large, you know, any, any kind of walk-in business, which a theater is, and it's, you know, you're at a place, you're at a destination that a large amount of consumers come to and pass by on a, on a daily basis. And in the movie theater business, it's usually kind of concentrated on the weekends. And so you need to grab that consumer's attention whenever they're there and hook them for the next time that they're there or give them a reason for there to be a next time to come. What I saw happening before I left, and it, it, was, it was a slow roll because I, I remember the first time I saw a, a digital marketing display was probably in 99, definitely in 2000. Um, don't even know if those companies are still around, but kind of the first people that pioneered digital marketing assets um, a lot of them were signage companies that were already in the concession space. So theater, you know, theater circuits and, and theaters were familiar with them already. And they found that seeing video, surprise, surprise to all the social digital folks out there, video, you know, it's like a 200% increase in people paying attention to it over static. So, you know, when I, when I started in this business, 
one sheets or posters and standees or the cardboard cutouts. Those were my static displays, you know, banners, modifications on all those things. And I tried to get those in a, as many theaters as possible, but they were expensive to create. They were expensive to make. They were expensive to physically distribute and set up. Not so much the one sheets, but all the other stuff. And so I welcomed kind of the dawn of the digital lobby. Wim, you've got uh, cinema partners all over the world. China has a pretty progressive, uh, pretty advanced build out of, uh, of cinema. What have you seen that you liked and how do you answer, uh, you know, John's call for more, more digital in the lobby? You know, you're preaching to the choir here, right? So, so uh, <laughs> when, I, when I hear this, this, we call it the lobby takeover, right? So, so creating the content that you get one impression and it could be about a movie, could be about theme. But I think so, so for me, two things, right? I think absolutely we need to get the lobby digital because for me, that's where the showmanship starts, right? And you have the chance to bring that showmanship in a much more, I would say, uh, animated way in a much more exciting way when it's digital, right? So I think we, we definitely, because you, you want when you come in, you say, whoa, I'm already in a different place, right? The other thing where I think is is uh, also another element if I think about lobby, yes, it's about consuming things, it's about buying things, about you know buying the next purchase about things, about the concessions, but it's also about efficiency, right? People want to get through the lobby in, in they want to pick up the stuff they want, they want to buy the stuff they want, they don't want to make long in line, uh, they want to get the options they want and stuff like that, and they want to get to, to their rooms, right? So you also you entertain them through the showmanship, but you also want to make sure the efficiency stays there because that's part of where people, you know, you say about what is holding people back of going to the theater, right? It's getting the parking lot and it's, you know, the time it takes or being in the lobby and standing in line too long. Those are the things I think as, as an industry we need to focus on to optimize. Uh, you can do so many things online these days that people can pick it up when they come in, that, it, that, it, that it's a, and a great experience and they can take the time to watch the showmanship and then think about the next purchase, right? So I think with a digital lobby, we have a much better chance of making that happen. All the theaters are, are, are ultimately pushing to digital. And it's not only more, it creates a lot of awareness and it's captivating and it bring, it pulls the consumer in, the moviegoer to help them make their next purchase decision. But what it also does, and I think this helps the businesses, I've heard that, it increases concession sales. You know, like if they put a hot dog on that on that sort of digital takeover, they see increases and in per heads for that concession item um, or purchase choices for that concession item. So it works both ways. The studios love using it and, and so do the exhibitors. Our insider today is John C. Hall of Cardinal Trio Pictures. We'll be right back. The Insiders is proudly presented by Cineonic. Cineonic's future-ready enhanced services and technology solutions provide compelling cinema experiences, peace of mind, and financial flexibility. Today, with more than 95,000 projectors installed globally, cinemas around the world trust laser projection by Cineonic to power the next generation of movie going. Visit Cineonic.com today and discover why theaters look to Cineonic to provide the solutions of tomorrow today. Our guest insider is John C. Hall. He joins us from Los Angeles. John, I'd like you to ask a question about the Cardinal Trio pictures, right? The work you're doing there. What are the kind of platforms you do expect to bring the, the content to? That's a great question. Um, it's funny because when we set out, the three of us, me, me and my two partners, Chazen Parker and, and Nick Sherma, when we formed the company, we decided we were going to be theatrical first. Um, we were going to be a theatrical first company. We wanted, if possible, all of our movies to debut theatrically and then, you know, window down downstream. Um, not that we wouldn't take a streaming deal. We have episodic content, you know, we would probably take a streaming deal, a streaming distribution deal on, on some of our content, but we prefer to, to start theatrically. When we launched the company in October of 2020, you know, we, we didn't have anything. And then we was, you know, we had decided to start the company prior to the pandemic. We officially launched it when my contract ended at, at Universal in October of 2020. And we announced kind of our three lead projects. They were the Enron movie, which it has a working title, so it's not going to be called that for long. And then we had another movie called Killer, which Nick Sherma, our partner, brought to the table. And then the third project was the Token Groomsmen 
um, which is a script that I co-wrote with Andrew Mortazavi. And so those were kind of the first three movies of our slate. Indie production and, and you know, indie content making is super, um, super difficult. Obviously, it takes financing. Uh, so you need to attract financiers just like you would to any, you know, uh, new starting company. Um, and then raising that financing to create those movies and then go get all the above the above the line and below the line talent that you need to execute a mu- movie. It's dozens and dozens of folks as comes as no surprise to anyone. But when we set out, we set out to make all three of those titles theatrical first and then and then window down through th- through the other streams. There has been a, a consolidation that's gone on in this industry over the last 20 years so that you have four or five kind of mega companies. You're now a partner in Cardinal Trio Pictures, which is kind of bucking that trend as an individual, smaller company. What advantages do you have as a smaller company swimming with the whales? I don't even know if there's majors and minors anymore as much as there are like or or add a new category megas, you know, the the three megas, if you will, that coincidentally, wink, wink, are all tied to like multi-billion dollar media companies. Right. Um, So you have your megas, then you have your majors, which the mate, the the field of majors is is leaner now because, you, you know, Disney acquired one and the other three kind of tiered up, if you will. Um, And then you have your minors, Um, you know. Ultimately, I think our goal would be to build this company up to become another miner, uh, you know, to follow in the footsteps of a Neon or an A24 or the like. Um, we're not there yet, and, and we're under no delusions that we are. One thing that makes us a little, you know, we can pivot quicker. We can make decisions faster. Uh, we can say things like, you know, we're planning to be theatrical first because um, there's, there's only a small group of us. So um, we can be nimble. You know, we can change our minds. We can we can update things. We can move quickly. Um, you know, we can even flip our slate around. You know, there's a couple other titles that we're working on with with other production companies. So there, you know, there's a lot of of easy pivots or being nimble at a company our size. But then there's just as many challenges. You know, it, the financing challenge is constant. You know, sometimes I feel like all my job is, is, you know, when I'm not doing the fun part of my job, all it is, is being on phone calls, you know, asking people for money, asking people for investment. So, John, so Spider-Man has become a $2 billion movie at the moment. It was never offered as a, as a, on the streaming services. Is there a lesson to be learned from the studios here? What can be learned from this, of this fantastic success? I think what the marketplace is finding is that there's kind of this sweet spot. You know, it, it, it was never the, the 60 days and out or 90 days and out that exhibition had kind of stuck to or that, you know, the industry had kind of ad- adopted, you know, really since like VHS, I guess, or, or, or you know, in the late era of VHS. I, I feel like, you know, going, going, you know, less than 15 days I don't know. I feel like you're cannibalizing the marketplace. A lot of these streaming sites that did those day and date tests, they they would know best. But you do see, you know, it's hard to it's hard to know because the pandemic was was afoot. But like you see these decreases and grosses of movies that you would have thought otherwise to do better on on some of the studios that have streaming services. How many weekends do you think you need? Uh, one of our guests, I think it was Chris Aronson of Paramount said, you know, you need three weekends, three yeah. good weekends. Is that your sense as a, as a filmmaker? I was going to say that prior to you mentioning Chris. And, and since Chris said it, I, I fully adopt that, that, you know, those three weekends are when you get, I think it's over 75%, maybe over 80% of the, the initial theatrical run. Obviously, movies, some movies play out longer than that and, and leg out in theaters. Back before the pandemic, I worked on a, a movie, Green Book, that, that started as a platform. It, it expanded. It hit its maximum number of screens and then legged out for a long time, got nominated for awards across the board, won some of those awards, and then continued to leg out. So I was actually just talking to an investor about this the other day, and they were kind of trying to identify that sweet spot. And it was like... Once you move past that three weekends, you know, you can have a movie that legs out and exhibition typically gets more, you know, more of the gross revenue out of that because the deals kind of pivot a little bit. But then you're then you're worrying about, you know, the next movie coming in and, you know, screen size, uh, screen auditorium size, rather seating size has shrunk. You know, I think 
it's, you know, like it's not uncommon to be in a hundred, 150, 200 seat auditorium. And if you're, if you're programming a movie and you're in its fourth week and you're selling less seats, I feel like you would rather that movie just keep going down the life cycle of, of, of film. And then you re, you know, you reprogram that screen with a brand new movie. Um, there's certainly enough content. We just talked about that. Uh, and as we emerge from COVID, you're going to see people start to, you've already seen it this week alone. There's been a lot of movies that have, that have jumped on the release schedule. Um, so you're going to continue to see that as we emerge from COVID. I think this year's box office is going to be very close to pre pandemic norms. So let's talk about the rest of this year. Wim, your partners have actually been shown some some of Avatar, and you have uh, indicated that people are generally excited. The word is that we may see Avatar trailers beginning in May, uh, and that gets to your point, John, about you know starting your campaign early on, so we may start seeing them in theaters. How do you feel about Avatar, and, and Wim, let's start with what you're hearing. I think everybody's very excited about Avatar, right? I think it, it's been... A record winner before box office buys, and of course everybody knows that James Cameron he can pull things out of his head, right? So he's going to do great. But the footage people have seen, you know, they they all come back and say, "Wow, right?" kind of thing. So this really brings people back to the theater. You know, people say, you know, this is really uh, going to bring 3D back in a different light, kind of thing, because really made for 3D movie going. So so I think the things, uh, and of course, is also with you know playing with the frame rates and all that stuff. So trying to do use different. You know, elements of the technology to see how we can make that that movie even more uh, impactful. So I think everybody's looking forward, and I think it is at the year end. We still have some time to gr- grind uh, grind up to that one, uh, but it, the the excitement is is big. I've not heard anybody uh, anybody saying that that he's not excited of that movie at that that moment in time. John, you've been involved in Minions, which is an amazing franchise. Uh, are you looking forward to that? Yeah, I absolutely am. I, you know, the minions, they, they hold a special place in my heart, not only because they're amazing, you know, they, they have literally overnight kind of become um, part of our, our zeitgeist, you know, talk about in, in the book that I wrote that there is no such thing as overnight success in Hollywood, unless you're a minion, right? Because like, from the moment those guys hit the screen, really in the trailer of, of the first Despicable Me movie, and then to their own you know, their own uh, offshoot and Minions, which I think was one of the highest grossing, if not the highest grossing of the franchise, you know, if you don't bifurcate those franchises. And then the new ones coming out, it's, you know, the rise of the rise of Gru, I think. Um, I love the filmmakers behind that. Working on those those Minions, Minions content was kind of how I cut my teeth as, as a senior executive, uh, you know, coming up with a lot of ideas. Uh, one of them, like covering covering the Cinerama dome to look like a yellow minion. Um, you know, that, that stuff like that just got national attention and, and, you know, minions are here to stay and they're, they're just one more reason why, you know, theatrical experience is just beyond compare. You, you can't experience the way the minions mischievously do what they do in any other format and, and, and have the same kind of feelings about it. Well, the Marvel folks are very excited about Dr. Strange in, in yep. May. So it feels as if uh, Hollywood's putting its best foot forward. And you say you think this year will be like the pre-pandemic kind of record-breaking year. What do you base that on? And we're all hoping you're absolutely right, but but what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to go on record as thinking it'll exceed. I think it'll it'll come right up to, you know, let, let's say 85 to 90 percent of, of the business of pre-pandemic. That'd be a great year. That'd be a a great year, year ago, I don't think you could say that. A year ago, if you'd said that, I, I think people would roll their eyes at you. But I, I feel like it, it can happen. You know, if this new Jurassic movie does what the the first Jurassic World did, that movie alone will add a percentage point or two. But yeah, I mean... Uh, I, I think that there's more and more stuff being dated. You know, I think I said earlier, stuff gets dropped into the schedule daily in the last week or so post Oscars. That will continue. You're, you're going to see indie movies start to, to stake out dates. You're going to see additional tent poles that were either in production or slowed production because of COVID. Now, the one thing that I do want to qualify is 2019 was kind of an unprecedented year at the box office because you had Disney doing like, I don't know, what was it, like a 40% share 
of the marketplace, which is just unheard of. I don't think any, any studio had ever, you know, not in modern times anyway, any studio had ever hit that level. I think they usually top out in like the 20, you know, the low twenties or high teens in, in terms of market share percentage. And there were, you know, it was, it was, it was by design, right? Like they were launching Disney plus. So they put together their, their best possible Disney live action. They put together their best Pixar and Disney animation. They put together their best Avengers, you know, the completion of the Avengers or the first Avengers series, uh, the, the, the end to the Skywalker saga, if you will, in, in the star Wars world. So you had all this stuff happening at one time. And, you know, I don't know that that'll ever be replicated again. And they did all that to, to launch their streaming service. So by the way, they launched their streaming service on the back of a bunch of theatrical titles. So if that doesn't say it all, I, you know, I'll, I'll shut up. Well, a lot of the analysts are saying the reason Pixar is a Disney plus mainstay and their movies are going to Disney plus and not theatrical is because it keeps the the subscribers happy. It's the strongest internal brand on Disney Plus to keep families happy. So yeah, using theatrical to to keep your streaming service vital. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, all we can say is that our industry is so lucky to have you in it. This is uh, this has been absolutely fantastic, John, and we wish you and and Cardinal Trio every success. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you very much. It has been an absolute honor. I love this industry. I love talking about it. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to be a cheerleader anytime you need me. Thank you, John. Wim and I will be right back. Hey, listeners, the Insider Show podcast is going to Las Vegas and Caesars Palace for the annual CinemaCon meeting beginning April 25th. We'll have studio insiders and cinema owners gathering together to talk about what's coming to your movie theater soon. So join us. Wim, what a guest. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, he, uh, he's definitely an enthusiast and passionate about his industry and knows a lot about it. So it's great, great to have him on board, yeah. Well, it's here. It's interesting because he wore so many hats at Universal and mm. his confidence in the cinema experience and also understanding there are certain aspects, episodic programs seem to fit perfectly on streaming and never right. really will be thought of as uh, cinema products. It's that he's got his, his thoughts about the media right now kind of organized, and he's very, very bullish about the theatrical uh, experience and the and the business model. No, no, and, and again, on one hand, we like that, but on the other hand, it's somebody who has experience, right? So having the theatrical first, I think, is the right phrase here, and it, it doesn't mean that streaming cannot follow, but you want to see it theatrical first, I think. That, that's really what... Uh, but stuck with me and, and, and uh, I believe is an important takeaway here. Well, this is our last program of our, our season. Our next season begins at CinemaCon in a couple of weeks in Las Vegas, the annual gathering of the National Association of Theater Owners. And I'm struck as we look back at this, this season of 12 episodes, Wim, is that it began in the absolute depths of COVID. Now there seems to be a real idea that COVID's going to be with us, but so are the movies. As we finish up, where are we right now, and, and how does the future look for you? No, I think it, it's, you bring up a good point here, Jim. So I think if we, if we flash back here, I think uh, a lot of people in the movies would still feel very strong also 12 months ago, but the overall public wasn't, right? The overall public felt like, you know, you're fighting for survival as an industry. And I think when we look at now and, and Spider-Man, Batman, uh, and an avatar coming up and things like that. And uh, I just saw Morbius the other day, which which was I think was stunning. But but then, then you say, well, whoever would thought it wouldn't you know wouldn't be strong, right? Because watching it that way is is, is very unique. Thank you, Wim. Our quote of the day comes from a review left by a moviegoer about a new feature film called Everything Everywhere All at Once. Written and directed by Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert, the movie is scoring an astounding 96% score with critics and 95% approval with audiences on Rotten Tomatoes. The fan writes in his review, this film is about a lot of things, generational trauma, the immigrant experience, love versus duty, and the choices we make that leave us wondering how our lives could have been different had we said or done one thing differently. I bawled my eyes out, but I also laughed, and I left the theater feeling like I just had a particularly raw but productive therapy session with the urge to call my mother, and I recommend this movie to everyone I've ever met. 
we close with the realization that nothing can touch us quite like a great movie. Thank you, Wim. Thank you, John. And thank you all for joining us. The Insiders is presented by Cineonic and produced by the Advanced Imaging Society in Hollywood. Our executive producers are Adam Castles in New York and Mike Piltzecker in Los Angeles. Brett Harrison produced today's show, and our technical director is Matthew Bach Lombardo. This is AIS. <laughs>